Welcome to the NU Digital Classroom. This is CHSF 2106. Hope you're doing well. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Today, or tuning in as if you're all watching on, listening on radio dials. Um, today, I want to talk about this idea of things that influence or determinants, right? Things that determine our psychological health and how our psychological health is influenced by understanding these concepts of empathy and what what empathy means and also what it doesn't mean and I'm going to kind of try to give you a, a hopefully an interesting view on that how it relates to things like decision making and collaborating but in general I want to look at this idea of well how to construct like some psychological resilience in this difficult time that we're in right and how to and maybe you're doing well yourself but it's also like how to encourage development in the people around us right because you know even if if things are sort of under control under your roof it's not too you don't have to look along around too long to find people that could use some support especially if we're talking about things like mental health and building you know real community real relationship and real stability of mind love you catching on slide too hope you're doing well look into their eyes, you know somebody is home. They're an animal that possesses great spiritual power not to be meddled with. Orange County Sheriff's Office. We need SO to respond for a dead person at SeaWorld. A whale has eaten one of the trainers. Silicone, though, is the one that went after her. Don is the senior trainer here at Shamu Stadium. She captured what it means to be a SeaWorld trainer, that it made me realize what happened to her really could have happened to anyone. I've been expecting somebody to be killed by a telecom. We weren't told much about it, other than it was trainer error. It didn't just happen. It's not a singular event. You have to go back to understand this. The speedboat herded them in, and they could just pick out the young ones. This is the worst thing that I've ever done. When Tillicum arrived at SeaWorld, he was twice as large as the next animal. We stored these whales in what we call a module, which was 20 feet across and 30 feet deep, and the lights were all turned out. Probably led to what I think is a psychosis. in captivity are all psychologically traumatized. It's not just Tillicum. If you were in a bathtub for 25 years, don't you think you'd get a little psychotic? Dawn would tell you that it was her mistake. They blamed her. It's just a bold-faced lie. I was just instructed to get rid of the day. The industry has a vested interest in spinning these. That sells a lot of Shamu dolls. It sells a lot of tickets at the gate. There's no record of an orca doing any harm in the wild. So I'm sorry if that video was a little shocking. I want to make an argument to you today, though today, and I want to talk a little bit about telecom and about this blackfish, right? The Aboriginal peoples in, in on the west coast in in the kind of BC area thought that these blackfish had were almost these mythical animals, right? That they were heavily spiritual. And there's a there's a reason I'm making these points and and hopefully it'll become apparent that but I want to kind of tell the story a bit right Tillicum who's recently passed away was captured in 18 in 1983 
which is kind of interesting. He was, he was like basically my age. He was 22 feet, six inches long, 22 feet. Just think about that, right? Like just a, a way of thinking about it is a basketball net's 10 feet up. So it's twice the height of basketball net plus more would be how long it would be. 12,000 pounds. Right, he gave birth to 20, or he fathered, sorry, because he's a male. He fathered 22 babies, right? 10 of them are alive today. He baby he fathered most of the whales in North American captivity. Or at least his sperm. But he had a terrible life. He's the, the whale largely featured in Blackfish, right? Caught at a young age, put in these isolation chambers, and, you know, uh, the male, the females in orca groups are dominant. So he was victimized by intense bullying, right? And, and bullying in the orca community is, is brutal. It's basically teeth scratching, scratching with their teeth, right? So Tilikum was like so cut up and that they would like, well, it's brutal. It's like basically paint them black. It's like. And this is an animal with the prefrontal cortex. This is an animal that has an ability to understand social reality at a level that you don't. And I'm, I'm not I'm saying that because you're a human. I'm going to show you some, some MRI footage in a second here. One of the one of the reasons why I think like the or whole orca conversation is so interesting is because we know that they're advanced, right? We might in hindsight look back and realize how, or and wonder how we never realized just how incredibly intelligent they are, right? One of the things that you'll see is like, we're incredibly limited trying to communicate with cretaceans, right? With like whales and dolphins because that they have their, their hands and they do have hands, right? They have fingers, but they're webbed, <laughs> they're covered. Like if you were to see a dolphin skeleton, you would see what I mean, that it has fingers, right? But like, it's covered in a flipper, which makes the main way we've tried to communicate with dolphins is through kind of versions of American Sign Language. And when you don't have, when you can't separate your hands, you're incredibly limited in what you can do, right? Like obviously, you've heard this before that dolphins use echolocation. And it's like, if you really want to get to the depths of some kind of communication with dolphins, it's going to be acoustic. And it's not like people haven't experimented with that, but like, well, it's, it's interesting because I almost like went into this whole rant about like the philosophy around that. Like if you could understand a dolphin, if you could theoretically speak the same language, could you even understand each other? Cause your frame of reference would be so different. <clears throat> and if you like, if you have trouble understanding that concept, just think of if you've ever been around a group of people talking about like say talking really heavily about really specifically about sports and you don't care about that sport or really sp specifically about some show that you don't care about or some celebrity that you don't care about and it's like you understand the words they're saying but you're like not following or whatever it's like times that by like a million and it's like that lack of frame of reference it's a classic like Kierkegaard I think is the one that said it like even if you and a lot even if you could teach an English uh te teach English to a lion you wouldn't be able to communicate because you'd have nothing no frame of reference. Language is completely based in a frame of reference. That's like a weird side note that I just thought and I figured I'd tell you what I was thinking about, but their type of intelligence is so different, right? Like, and again, because of our ability to manipulate and to make tools and to, to write things down, especially and to, to pass writing through generations, it's like, we we have all these incredible things we have cities and we have this ability for me to like do a lecture to you on zoom through the internet which is like basically magic almost to our ancestors but it's like for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands well probably roughly two hundred thousand years humans were much closer to the animal world right much less and almost you could almost make an argument that what civilization is is the ability to not start at zero every time Right, that you're able to, you know, as Einstein famously said, stand on the shoulder of giants. You're standing on, you know, it's like I've said this to my class in Kitchener before. It's like, if I drop three of you off on an island, would you ever be able to invent a toaster? 
you know what it is already you know what it looks like you could probably with a lot of thought think of some of the components it's like let's assume you were somehow able to even master electricity and had something you could plug it into would you be able to make a toaster it's like and that and i don't know if i would be able to even with an unlimited amount of time it's like there's so many little things that other people have done that we've incorporated into our ability to successfully move through life it's like a real hallmark of human intelligence and this is why i'm on this rant is this idea about what even intelligence is and since since that's what our intelligence has looked like that's what we're almost like trained or, or designed to be able to see intelligence as Maybe workers are, are at a whole different level of spiritual, emotional, social connection that is just... Well, let me keep making my argument. The part of the whale brain or, or cetacean brain, cetaceans is basically like whales, dolphins, porpoises. And uh, this, I took this from a place where it was talking about orcas specifically because i don't think this point is going to be generalizing to all whales because there's obviously even within whales differences in, of intelligence <clears throat> but there's some amazing examples of whale intelligence right like humpback whales are, have been demonstrated to show altruism right there's been people that have been almost attacked by sharks and humpback whales have like gotten in between them and you can find stories of this on the internet and they they're kind of known in history as whales that like almost pull off miracles Right? like people are almost drowning and they might get saved by humpback now i know these are just stories but it's interesting that these stories always seem to be humpbacks or like sperm whales the most like poorly named creature of all time although the reason they're called that is because in groups they'll all kind of it's really wild if you look at it look at images of it or video if you can find it um because at night they'll come up to the surface and they're really long right and they'll kind of just be all bobbing there a whole bunch of them I guess that's where the, they look like sperm, I guess. But it's a poor name because it's like one of the coolest creatures on Earth. And I don't know, it's like... The sperm whale kills like giant squids on a daily basis and like lives in these depths of the ocean. has these like click sonic echo locators. And it like has, you know, they... And it'd be, it'd be wild to like throw a GoPro on the back of a sperm whale and just see what it sees goes so deep All right so anyways i got lost just talking about whales in general but or like there's like the there's another crazy, interesting whale thing right because orcas hunt narwhals right which if you've seen the narwhals it almost look like they have the unicorn horns out the front that are super long and their biggest predator up in the arctic is is orcas right and there's certain areas where there's orcas and so when those when the narwhals right the unicorn ones when they get near when they can sense that orcas are near because they're like hypersensitive right because these things all co-evolved and only so what that means is that they evolved in a world where there was orcas so that's shaped their evolution so when they're coming down and they can sense that orcas nearby they do something amazing they go completely silent and they get really close and they touch they touch each other to signal stuff they, they move to a completely touched based almost like not sign language like touch language almost like this is like I, I don't know what the coding is right i'd be making it up but it's like i remember seeing a documentary of that and just being i'm having my mind blown that they're like their whole communication system switches to almost like this like ninja complete stealth form right because they're hurt at all they're done they can't fight an orca so these are these are fascinating super advanced animals and it's like part of our, our our difficulty in understanding their intelligence is is how to scale it right or not even how to scale it how to how to make a comparison point right? what does it mean to say that most blue we think that blue whales know where all other blue whales are like what does that even mean right that they have these like deep deep echo location abilities right that they have these deep memory systems or you've heard like they have like hearts the size of a bus or whatever i just i don't know i don't know why i just threw in a random fact that may or may not be true that i remember from childhood but like it's like i've, I've been at the national museum of history in uh in new york city and seen like i think it was in new york or in washington but at one of them I, i've been at both and i've seen 
I saw the uh, like a full-size blue whale carcass. Not carcass, sorry. That'd be that'd be a lot. I think a carcass would just be a dead body, but I meant to say skeleton. And it's like you see that, and it's like it looks like a looks like a cruise ship. It's like wild to think that the blue whale is the biggest animal that's ever existed on Earth, including dinosaurs. And so now that we're about five minutes in, I guess I'll, I'll make my intended point that like the part of the brain that's in, responsible for emotions and and in memory formation is more complex than in humans. Like this is actually really interesting. If you look under the MRI, you can see that they have like almost a pre prefrontal cortex that seems to be directly up, that seems to fire up a lot when in relation to social things. So it's like almost like they have a processing of their social herd family tribe coreness that is that we almost just don't understand we like literally don't have the cognitive system that they have for that which is one of the reasons why pulling mom from baby is then so incredibly traumatizing so i don't necessarily need you writing down any of these points about orcas unless you find it interesting I'm kind of working towards my argument and I think I'm trying to make a point to you. So here's another thing I just thought of actually. Another intense thing is humpback whales will have conversations with their family members and their loved ones like with their the whales that they're in their pod. They'll have conversations that'll be like an hour long. They'll sing these long long songs I think I, I feel like I already went on a rant of this to you, but this is like how they basically, one of the ways that they fought against, the activists fought against whaling and is by recording the humpback songs and playing them in the major city, downtown cities in, in Europe and people starting to like hear these intelligent creatures, right? So I won't do that long because I feel like I already ranted about that in a totally different context. But orcas might be emotionally developed in humans. Right, MRI scans have shown that the brain lobes that deal with emotions are enlarged in the orca brain. Right, so almost have like a pre-lobe. I said pre-prefrontal cortex, but let's just say pre. Uh, we could say that, but it's only. Again, it's not like they have a human brain with an extra part. It's more like they have. Well, they have a brain. See, this is the thing. It's like anatomically, we're probably closer to chimps. Brain processing wise, you could probably make an argument to me that their closest thing to us is orcas. Or we might be the closest thing to it. And again, this all comes down to like, what do you mean by intelligence? Right? And what is. What do you mean by intelligence? Do you just mean tool use? Do you just mean the ability to acquire and apply knowledge that other members of your species have accumulated in the past? Or does it mean like, you know, your ability to... Orcas have specific languages that are specific to their pods. They have cultures. They have certain habits. They teach their prey within... Their, they teach their, sorry, their kids within the family how to hunt. That's why orcas and usually in the wild aren't reported to attack humans. One of the reasons we think that's the case is because... They are taught specifically what is food, and they only kill those things, right? So, where, say, for example, like a shark is just more indiscriminate, even though sharks are, like, poorly understood, too, but I won't go on a rant about that, right? But the MRI scans show that the, that the brain lobes that deal with emotional, right, and, and understanding emotion, right, so that is a lot of the frontal lobe, is enlarged in the orca brain. Because right, I know your emotions, a lot of your raw emotions are coming from the amygdala and stuff, but how you're making sense of that and how you're tying that emotion to your memory system and how you're um, using that, um, making sense of that emotion is involving other parts of the brain. In the wild, unlike other mammals, 
An oracle will typically remain with its mother until the mother dies. The baby will live as long as possible with mom. The depth of their connection is so deep. Remember, I was making the point before that, like, we don't really even understand what that extra part of the brain that seems to be directly relinked to this idea of kind of how they make memory and how their memory is socially connected. And what does that mean? Does that mean that they're actually subjectively experiencing themselves as family, not as individuals? Kind of like how wolves do. All right, so without jumping topics huge, like that's, there's an amazing book called Wolf on Wolf and Men or something like that. It's about like wolf psychology and how like wolves, we think like very much identify with the pack so much. And you've heard stuff like that before, like wolf packs, but they identify so much that they actually are seeing themselves as, as, a, as a unit within a pack, not as individuals. It's like very different psychological orientation. Okay, but I'm going to show a video on the next slide and it's like to hammer it home a bit keep this in mind right like an orca in the wild will often live with its mom until the mom dies its entire life right its entire life that the way that that actually plays out is usually it's like saying that baby stays with mom its whole life is basically saying stays with mom until mom dies unless there's some kind of accident right obviously the baby's going to outlive mom Okay. Baby Shamu. I know it was naive of me, but I thought that <laughs> it was our responsibility to do as much as we could to keep their family units together, since we knew that in the wild that's what happens. Yes, sir. That's our baby. What? Kalina was the first baby Shamu. Baby Shamu, SeaWorld's newest star. Don't she had become quite disruptive uh, and challenging her mom a little bit and disrupting some shows and that kind of thing. She's got the whole place jumping, Shamu. She's our baby whale. It was decided by the higher-ups that she would be moved to another park when she was just four, four and a half years old. And that was uh, news to us as trainers that were working with her. To me, it had never crossed my mind that they might be moving the baby from her mom. The supervisors um, basically was kind of mocking me, like, oh, you're saying poor Kalina? You know, what's she going to do without her mommy? And, you know, and that, of course, just shut me up. <laughs> so the night of the move, we had to deploy the nets to separate them and get Kalina the baby into the med pool. And Katina was, was generally a quiet whale. She was not an uh, overly vocal whale. Um, after Kalina was removed from the scene um, and put on the truck and taken to the airport, and Katina, her mom, was left in the pool. She stayed in the corner of the pool, um, like literally just shaking and screaming, screeching, crying. Like, um, I'd never seen her do anything like that. Um, and the other females in the pool, maybe once or twice during the night, they'd come out and check on her, and she'd screech and cry, and they would just run back. There was nothing that you could call that watching it besides grief. Those are not your whales. You know, you love them, and you think, I'm the one that touches them, feeds them, keeps them alive, gives them the care that they need. They're not your whales. They own them. Kasaka and Takara were very close. Kasaka was the mother, Takara's the calf. Takara was special to me. They were inseparable. When they separated Kasaka and Takara, it was to take Takara to Florida. Once Takara had already been stretchered out of the pool, put on the truck, driven to the airport, Kasaka continued to make vocals that had never been heard before. They brought in the senior research scientists to analyze the vocals. They were long range vocals. She was trying something that no one had even heard before looking for Takara. That's heartbreaking. How can anyone 
look at that and think that that is morally acceptable. It's not. It is not okay. It's the worst thing you could do to both of them. The most torturous thing you could do to either of them is to separate them. So like that's so tough to watch, right? Because you're all psychology students and good people and it's like you don't have to necessarily care all that much about whales specifically to understand that what you just witnessed was the formation of PTSD. You just witnessed trauma in real life and, and not in real life, I meant to say in real time. You saw the, 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 the orca shaking, making that sound. You heard that sound. That sound was it trying to search for its baby. It trying to use acoustical signaling that we've never even heard another whale ever do like that's heart-wrenching that's like any parent can re relate to the anguish the the panic the obsessive panic right the other it's that that was just a little clip from blackfish but it, it was mentioned how the, the other orca females were like coming up to try to see if they could comfort her at all, right? And she was like having none of it. And they were she was actually scaring the other female whales. They didn't know what she was doing. Well, they probably knew, like they would have understood that with it differently, better than the researchers because they would. But again, right, they brought in unique researchers because they hadn't heard that before, even the people that worked with them all the time. And this is kind of the point that, like, this is kind of like, I'm about to read a quote from Rick O'Berry, who's like a big person in this world of trying to make this point that, like, it's their cognition and their, their consciousness is an intelligence. And the fact that they're so aware of the trauma they're undergoing is, like, the argument for why why this stuff needs to stop and i know as much as anyone like i grew up loving marine land i didn't know i didn't realize it's a tough topic but but the but again it's like it's something we need to grow out of as a, as people right and maybe what we do is in the future like we learn how to like through gopros and through like immersive vr like somehow find out ways to kind of learn about orcas and experience it like without putting them in in cement pools right that like destroy their mind and give them psychosis so rick O'Berry, this guy behind the movie the cove and behind this right he was actually the star in the movie flipper and popularized dolphins and views himself as like one of the main reasons behind the spread of captivity for dolphins and he went through a huge depression about it and then he tried to he's kind of dedicated his life to trying to stop it anyway so he's making this point about orcas that orcas are and he's making this at the un that actually you could psychologically consider them as non-human people or like obviously not humans but that they're persons that the species of topic today this is his point is one that's demonstrated many human-like qualities, things that we would recognize as intelligence, language, an exquisite sense of emotional capacity. The orcus, the orcanus orca, the killer whale, these massive toothed whales, which are actually the largest dolphins, are homed in the cold waters of the North Atlantic, North Pacific, and Antarctic, but dwell in the vast expanses around these areas, sometimes swimming hundreds of miles a day, hundreds of miles. Right, so I like to give as an example, right? Like I live in Kitchener, a hundred mi a hundred miles would be basically to Toronto. Or so they basically drive from like or drive, they basically swim from like Kitchener to Toronto every day. It's like that's an epic distance. So you can see how like you obviously they're not in tanks from Kitchener to Toronto. Even if they're in tanks, that would be huge for a human. The largest killer whale ever found was 10 meters. 10 tons, so 20,000 pounds. One ton is 2,000 pounds, 20,000 pounds. 
However, not only are their brains massive, so too are their brains. Postmortem are not only their bodies massive, so too are their brains. Postmortem, so after death, MRI studies of killer whales' brains have shown that it's on the scale of, you know, three and a half to six and a half times as, as depending on, on if it was a male or female and the age of the whale. Um, three and a half to six and a half times as big as a common dolphin. Another one of these Cretacean uh, species are like whale, uh, they're dolphin species, but again, Cretacean is whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Another species that demonstrates these kind of non human, person like qualities. That's like such a specific way of saying it, right? Like he's obviously acknowledging that he's not saying they're humans. That'd be silly. Like that's not at all what the point is. The point is that they're like psychologically advanced enough that they're should be treated as such and basically left alone. So I should maybe switch this in the slide that I just read in order because this slide comes best right after like the point I was making before about if you have young kids or if you like even have younger siblings or if you're just thinking about maybe having kids in the future or even if you just care about other people in your life that you love that aren't kids it doesn't necessarily matter this idea of like if you could see that whale and you could see what it was going through and you felt bad at all and you're able to empathize with it it's like one of my points is that you can empathize with that whale. It's like you have no idea what the subjective viewpoint of a whale is, right? Like obviously it's almost like laughable to talk about trying to consider what it would be. It's like we have no idea. Right? We can see that their their brain has certain anatomical and function kind of based similarities to a human brain in a whole bunch of ways. But when you saw that whale shaking and screaming, you could tell it was trauma. You could tell it was pain. You could tell that was panic. You didn't need to, me to tell you that that whale was panicking. It's like if that made you feel crappy, it's like that's kind of this idea. It's like empathy is not a philosophy. It's a feeling. It's like why why did you feel crappy because part of your brain's able to it's called mirror neurons you're able to see that trauma and think about that you wouldn't want that at a deep level and it's the same reason why if someone mirror neurons it's an interesting idea right it's why if somebody like gets cut in a movie or something you might like go like this or if something like happens it's like you you start to like almost it's so connected it's like your your psychological involvement with your situation it's like and the reason i wanted to show that it's like this is a different species this isn't even a human species but this is a species that's intelligent and this is a species that you don't necessarily need to understand how they're psychologically cognitively processing their reality to understand what emotional trauma looks like to them Right? And if you could see the trauma there, then you were able to identify with a creature that was completely different than you. So I don't know if this was effective or not, but I was really trying to use this, this orca example to get to this idea of like what actually empathy is. Right? It's not a philosophy. It's not some nice thing. It doesn't mean that I can like... It's a deep idea. It's like, can I cognitive, not only cognitive, can I cognitively and emotionally and kind of spiritually and even try to in an embodied way, try to think about like what it would actually be like to be you in your situation with your struggles? Can I actually try to see you as you and understand that at, at the end of the day, this is a mental exercise. I don't actually know you. I don't actually know how you're making sense of it or what your emotions are right now. But it's like, I'm going to make a branch in a second towards counseling and basically make the point that this is kind of core to being a counselor it's like can you be real and genuine and authentic with people and be like able to see here i'm gonna this isn't I'm, i know i'm recording um i downloaded this i took a picture of this just today 
is Carl Jung. It's an amazing quote. He says, Carl Jung, like my favorite psychologist. I like follow on like Instagram or whatever, someone that it's like Carl Jung quotes or something. But he says, know all the theories, master all the techniques. But as you touch a human soul, be just another human soul. Pretty good quote, right? It's like that idea. It's like, if I want to actually help you, it's like, it's great that I've like studied about, you know, different counseling techniques and I can, I know different cognitive behavioral exercises and all these kind of things. And it's like, but what you really need from me, if you're my best friend and it's two in the morning on a Saturday and you just got, went through a bad breakup and you're in a terrible place, is you need me to be a human being with you. You need me to genuinely care. You need me to be a real and authentic and not be fake with you and not feed you flowery advice that you know is empty. You need me to sit with you maybe in your hell for a bit so that you can start to see the light again. It's like, that's the core of counseling. It's like, can you, can you meet people where they're at? Because sometimes that's like the most therapeutic thing you can do with someone. So, one of the, oh, I almost forgot the music, one of the ideas, and I, I told you why I do that, right, I think, I hope it adds a little bit to it, and it also makes you not hear the computer fan, so, if only that, it's worth it, but, uh, and I have a couple notes with this presentation, but as you can probably tell, I'm kind of freestyling a bit, but not really like freestyling within reason, right? Like I had it set up, but I'm just kind of trying to talk and be a little bit more informal with this presentation. Cause like, I know as we got, especially that last presentation, chapter three and a few of them, right? The more physical ones are a little bit kind of more biology based. And, and I like that stuff and I'm interested in it. And I like showing you animations and cool stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I'm more of a, like the therapeutic psych is what really sparks my interest and has really kind of kept me interested in this field for so long is that like developmental psychology there's there's only so much time we're going to talk about psychology before we get to the topic of therapeutics and like okay well how can you use this understanding of the human mind to help people that are struggling and this is why i want to talk to you and you're important people and it's like you're a big class and you're a big class full of people that are going to get into working with young people you know, not all of you, obviously, some of you will work with people of different ages, but like, I have, I feel like I have like a few hours of your time to make the point to you that actually like, you're going to take other classes where they're going to teach you like in this situation, do this, in this situation, do this. And it's like, I want to just stress this point that like who you are as a person is what matters the most. That's right, like Jung has another saying, I don't know if I have this later in the presentation, I might and I'll, I'll highlight it again, but like, he has this idea that like, sorry, I said Carl Jung, another one of my favorites that we're going to talk about today is a guy named Carl Rogers. He has this point that like, you know, early on in his career that he basically was like always focused on trying to find what's wrong with people. And then he started to realize that no, like what I need to do is learn how to use myself in this conversation as a way to help you sort of figure out, I don't want to do Jerry Maguire and be like, help me help you. But it's like, that is an aspect of counseling because I'm never going to understand your experience to the same level you are, that you do. Just like you can't to me because, you know, we're a single organism that has eyes on the front of our heads and we go through the world and our sense organs help us make sense of things. And when I'm sensing my world, I'm playing it off of a system of memories that I've developed that's different than yours and that's why two people standing beside each other looking at the same thing are experiencing it differently it's like well it's because we're sensing maybe the same thing but our perceptual system and we talked about this last time but is like you know we call this subjective or whatever but it just means that like everyone sitting in the classroom listening to me talk or whatever if we're doing this live and some of you are super interested and some of you are hardcore bored and some of you are just looking for what do we need to know for the test so that i and then some of you are like thinking about lunch later or whatever right and it's like that's all understandable it's like that's in any group of people but it's like if you try to actually care about me this is a weird thing to say but it's like it'll change your experience of me 
Or like if you actually care about my life at all. And it doesn't have to be in a super intense way, but it's like, you know, I got two little kids. I got a, and a wife and I have like, you know, my own stresses and stuff. And, and, and I try to keep in mind that like, so do you, right? And I, that's why I'm trying to be like flexible with stuff. And, you know, if you reach out to me, I try to help however I can. It's like, I can't imagine what it must be like being like for some of you, like being like a 20 year old in this scenario and having gone through the last few years of the pandemic and being bombarded with everyone's brainwashing regardless of what side it is it's like to just think clearly in 2022 is like a massive feat right so it's like i don't know i just want to show you that i'm like treating you like an adult like in the sense of having an honest conversation and just being like yeah like some of life is tough and if you want to be a good counselor you have to be able to meet people in their tough time and to do that you have to be flexible and to do that you have to be able to establish this idea and now i'll try to segue this perfectly so i'll actually get back to talking about my actual slide this idea of like empathic understanding right that like if you actually care about my life at all and if i care about your life at all and if we can like if you feel trust like now pretend we're in like a counseling scenario and like just think about it say you come to meet me as a counselor and you're telling me stuff and i'm like looks like I, I couldn't care less and I keep checking my phone and I'm like not making any eye contact or anything and it's like you feel like awkward it's like I could be like oh you need to do these six things and that could be perfect advice but what are the chances you're gonna do it you're gonna be like this guy doesn't even care you're gonna that my, my fakeness in that scenario is gonna push you away right we're not even gonna to use those terms like we're not even going to open up this avenue for communication and we're not going to make possible these potential insights or whatever because we're going to be stuck because you're just not going to you've all been around people before where you've had that read of them that they're kind of fake or maybe not necessarily fake or phony to use a catcher in the rye phase or phrase but like or that just Or that they don't care right and so also the pursuit of empathic understanding opens up basically this idea that like if you i made this point a couple of different times but like if you actually care about trying to understand what it's like to be me and i care about trying to understand what's you we're gonna obviously inter be more likely to have a successful interaction maybe i should say it like that there's always a million variables Right, but if I understand you understand that I like probably didn't wake up in the morning and hope to be a terrible teacher and it's like you probably didn't wake up in the morning and hope to be a terrible student it's like we're both doing our best in a complicated world and it's like then all of a sudden you give people like just the benefit of the doubt that's like all people need right like Carl Rogers calls it uh, like a generalized positive regard it's like you don't have to agree with everything I do but like you also don't have to like start doubting and judging right off the bat without giving the chance right so it's like and so let's keep going on this conversation so sometimes you hear people talk about this idea of emotional intelligence and <clears throat> It's tricky because there are some decent scales of emotional intelligence. Um, if you're wondering what I'm thinking about, I'm just trying to like think about how hard of a science it is. It's like it's nowhere near as like hard of a, it's not as valid of a scale as like as like the Big Five or IQ or something like that. But EQ is actually or in emotional intelligence. The Q just means quotient or score, right? So intelligence score is IQ. Uh, EQ is what they call emotional intelligence. I don't think they don't call it EIQ. The, so the acronym just right, It's just emotional quoting or whatever. But anyways, that's I should almost restart that slide because none of that's necessarily important to what I'm saying. But I'm going to keep it because I love you and I'm going to show you that you know if I really was I don't know my blooper reel would be endless. But yeah. Basically, there's this idea that like, okay, well, emotional intelligence actually breaks into this like 
four part like you could look at this at both a personal level right and it's both like what you see and what you do so this is kind of like um the awareness and the behavioral aspect so at a personal level right it's like can i be now this is a tough thing this is actually like the toughest thing like can i tell when i'm arguing with my wife that it's actually like me that's being super moody and I actually like brought a lot of negativity to the beginning of this conversation and probably pushed it to this direction and maybe it's not her that has all these things wrong maybe it's like right and if if I can have that self-awareness then maybe I can manage my emotions better self-management so a part of this empathy also implies to self right and realizing like you're a normal person you're going to be you have emotions too, right? We're gonna soon in a couple weeks talk about hot cognition and about how like our whole ability to think clearly gets like incredibly compromised when we're, when our emotions are engaged, let's say it like that. But then there's also like, so that's at a personal level, right? In terms of like, okay, well, I'm aware of like a better understanding of like who I am and what kind of triggers me or whatever to certain kinds of responses. And so therefore it like leads to a better understanding of kind of how to live my life or this self-management idea. And then at the social level, there's also this idea of like, let's say there's social awareness, right? Or the other word that's often used is situational awareness, like understanding your situation, understanding your social world and understanding like, even what I was saying before, it's like, Sometimes it's good to be thankful and have gratitude for things. It's like I sometimes it's easy, especially in a marriage, to like focus on only like the things that are upsetting to you, right? Or like, oh, my wife does this like one thing that bugs me. And it's like, yeah, but if I actually start to list it, she does a whole bunch of things that I'm actually pretty impressed by. Like how she like kind of seamlessly manages the schedule for the kids. And I know that like, and I help with lots of stuff, but like she's kind of the brains behind a lot of the organizing of our family. And it's like, it's easy to just take that for nothing right almost just like yeah but you do this one thing and it's like and this i know i'm not kind of being rambly but as you can tell i'm not like following a note i'm just trying to give examples for this right and make this point that like as we start to understand that ourselves better we start to understand that like yeah other people are dealing with all kinds of dynamics too and the same reason that I'm not always at my best, you're not always at your best, we're not both always at our best, our interactions not always being done around our best, especially with like COVID and stuff, right? Like if like 10 is totally out of control, sometimes people are leaving their house at like a seven or an eight already, then it's like, because people are stressed and people are agitated. Right, so like again, like go back to our frequency 528, it's like, that's what I'm playing in the background because it's like there's this interesting idea that it's associated with DNA repair. But anyways, the uh, I don't even know why I said that. But what I was trying to say is this idea of like as you understand yourself better, it also aids your ability to understand others better. And as you can control your emotions better, you can actually perceive things more clearly. It's one of the reasons in like martial arts or sports, you train so hard and in such intense scenarios so that then when you're actually in a scenario, you've, you've emotionally been in that scenario before. So you don't have the same kind of new overwhelmed panic. You have a situational awareness, a social relationship. Well, you have a social awareness of your situation and it helps you manage the situation depending on what it is whether it's another person, whether it's yourself. Okay, so even though I had said that it's like maybe not as, but that's a tough thing, right? I was comparing it to IQ and Big Five, and those are the, the most validated and, and, and replicated, uh, like reliable um, psychometrics that exist. So maybe that's a bit unfair. Um, there are some pretty good emotional intelligence scales out there. Right, but the the reason I said that is just because it became like a really hot topic, right? And people were like, oh, let's forget IQ. EQ is like what really dominates understanding things at work. And it's like, well, there's, there's a lot you can learn from EQ, but 
if you're predicting people's success in a whole variety of areas, IQ is still probably the single most telling psychometric, right? Because IQ is like, basically, how do you do on things related to other people? Uh, anyways, I won't, I'm not going to get deep into the psychometrics of IQ. I'm, I am in this course, but it's just a different presentation. Um, so I want to explain what IQ is and how Piaget was associated with developing the IQ tests and that IQ is really like, I'll just say it, I guess it's like a measure of what sort of the normal intelligence is supposed to be for your age and then what your score is. So then you just divide it right in times by 100. So like if 100 is an average IQ, so 100 would be like, I'm what my age would predict I would be. And if I'm over 100, I'm above average. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll give a better description. I'm just kind of freestyling that, but that's about IQ, right? But EQ, so you have to say like, okay, well, if I'm saying this is an important variable then, okay, can you measure it? And can you measure it and show uh, meaningful differences between people? And can those meaningful differences actually predict things? Like if you score different than your friend on EQ, does that tell me anything as a researcher about how you're likely to perform on a sports team or at work or in a marriage? And so the reason I have Coleman on here is like, Daniel Goleman is definitely like the, the authority on this topic. And there's a lot of people that kind of use his, his term, right? But he has this idea of this ability to recognize feelings as they happen. So now think about that, as they happen is an important part because this has like a mindfulness, kind of like I was saying on the last slide about management of self or of social situations. It has this like ability to recognize, doesn't matter as much if you're like, oh, I was upset earlier, I shouldn't have done that. It's like, okay, that's good that you can have that reflection, but it's way more powerful if you can notice it in the moment. You can notice like I'm not being my true self right now because I'm upset. And if I can, you know, if I can, here's a little trick, right? If I can put both hands above my head, especially if I can get my elbows higher than my shoulders. And if I, I'm not, I don't have sweaty armpits, so I'll do it, right? If I can just, that's an immediately the worry uh, as it would be for anyone, right? So you put the arms above your head. And you start taking these slow, deep breaths, right? And what you're doing is you're going to activate your parasympathetic nervous system, right? So it's like the opposite of your stress response. It's the, it's the rest and digest response, right? And it's pretty simple. Basically, you just have to open up your diaphragm and then start breathing slowly. Just like, I'll just do it. It's just like, nothing fancy. And the cool thing is, is you don't even have to believe me. You just have to do it. If you do that, you'll start to, to calm down. But anyways, I don't know why I all of a sudden got into like a psycho-psychological relaxation strategy. But, but that is actually a biohack, right? Get your elbows above your shoulders and breathe slowly. And what elbows above your shoulders because it expands your diaphragm. And then you take those slow breaths. It floods your system with, alco with alcohol, with oxygen. And that um, kind of flushes some of the cortisol, which was making you stressed. Right, but what he's saying is like, okay, so imagine if you could just take that analogy, right? You're in an argument with your loved one and you just like say, you just need a second, you just go aside, calm your physical body down and then go back into the conversation. It's like that ability to recognize your emotions as they're happening, feelings, emotions as they're happening. He says it's the cornerstone of emotional intelligence. It's like the stone, you know, I, just, we just, I think I've mentioned before, I've just had like my big, big huge retaining wall was getting worked on. It's like the cornerstone is like this, the last main one, right? It's like the most important stone. People who are more in touch with their feelings are better able to navigate their lives and are more competent decision makers, right? And why that? Why is that the case? Why are you better at making decisions when you score higher in emotional intelligence? Well, because you're less likely to be making a decision from a place of agitation. Welcome friends, we're live and it's Thursday now. Switch days between slides. Hope you're still doing well. Here we're looking at this idea right now. So I, I make the segue to what I was talking about before, this idea of empathy, right? And I wanted to highlight this. I'm about to get into talking a little bit about some psychologists like Robert 
I mean, uh, like Carl Rogers and Albert Ellis. And so I want to talk about this idea of like, okay, in, in therapeutic psychology, there's this idea that like active listening, you've heard it before, right? But it's basically like this idea that if you're like telling me something important, I'm like looking at my phone all the time. And if I'm like not looking at you and if I'm asking questions that make it sound like I'm not understanding what you're saying, it's like, obviously that's going to get in the way of my attempt to be, uh, to do therapy with you or to have a therapeutic influence on you. Right. So I wanted to make this point that like, even in this kind of core understanding of what social work or what counseling is, it's like focused on this idea of like, you need to be present with the person in the moment. You need to be asking questions and sh that show that you're following along. You need to be attending or like paying attention, obviously. You need to be like summarizing and paraphrasing. These are kind of like counseling skills. You need to know when to when it's time to allow a space or a silence. But that right up with that is that kind of cognitive and emotional skill set of being able to put yourself in the imagined position of the other right it's like i'm going to show you a quote in a bit from carl rogers that says it's like you're in somebody else's world but it's as if you are without forgetting that as if part of the sentence right you're not actually losing yourself you're saying that for me to help this person that i can help them best the best i understand what it's like to be them in this situation that's kind of applied empathy so some of you maybe have had this where like your parent tells you something and you're like listening to them or whatever, but then they're like, look at me when I'm talking, right? Or something like that. And it's like, well, why do people say that? Well, and that's like a very common thing, right? But it's like, well, where does that come from? It comes from the fact that you might be listening, but like if you're talking to me and I'm like looking off and I'm checking my watch and I'm looking, I'm communicating to you that I don't care whether or not I'm like, oh yeah, and whether or not I actually am following. My wife can be bad for that, right? Because she's like good at like, she will be following, and if I ask her questions, she'll be able to answer, and she was listening, but it's like, if you were to videotape us in some scenarios, not all the time, right, I'm like talking about scenarios I would complain about or whatever, but it's like, if you videotape that, you'd see that it didn't look like it, and I'm probably guilty of that too, obviously, right, so like, it's this idea of like, for me to actually express empathy towards you, I don't only have to feel that, I also have to express that. You have to feel like I am, right? Not necessarily be able to label it, but you need to feel like, and just think about it in a really practical sense. If you came in to meet with me and I was the therapist and you were the client, you would wanna think that I'm trying to understand what it's like to be you in your situation that you're dealing with and struggling with. And it's not enough that I do that, I need to communicate that I'm doing that. So just listen back to that last slide and I said the word like about a thousand times. So I apologize for that. I don't know why. It's like, it's like, 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 um, but it is weird because every time I restart doing, now that I'm trying not to say it, it's like the only word I want to say. But now that I'm starting to, it's weird every time you come back to a recording session, you sort of have to get back in the groove. This idea that empathy needs to be expressed to be effective, right? That you're only going to, have that therapeutic influence if you feel that connection, that empathic process isn't complete until the client has an opportunity to confirm or correct or embellish their feelings, right? That like, that my idea of who you are and what it's like to be you could be wrong. And so some of it is gonna be me as the therapist trying to ask you questions, trying to get you to clarify and trying to like push you to speak and and share in a way that's going to help me understand what you're trying to what it's like to be you what it's like to be you in your very specific troubles because the better i can understand that the more i'm actually going to be able to help you and this is kind of one of roger's big points that this is the idea behind person-centered or client-centered therapy that it needs to start out where the person's at. So you need that. The more accurate the read you can have of the person's situation, the more you're going to actually help them. It's the opposite of like a one-size-fits-all strategy. So if you look at this, empathizing occurs when we feel an appropriate emotional reaction. Right? Like if you, when I showed you that whale video, if your reaction to that was joy, like that would be a, that obviously would be wouldn't be empathizing empathizing kind of applies this idea of well in the near the end of this presentation i'm going to show you a video that talks about mere neurons or this idea of like you're actually sort of syncing up and connecting with the emotional cognitive experience of the other 
So true empathizing occurs when we feel an appropriate emotional reaction and emotion triggered by another person's emotion. It's done in order to understand the person, to predict their behavior and to connect with them or to resonate, right? To resonate or vibrate at the same frequency with them emotionally. We're trying to see their world. We're trying to appreciate them as human beings. We're trying to communicate our understanding of that. We're trying to understand what their feelings are. This is me just kind of explaining the picture, but that picture kind of gets at it in an interesting way. So that's a picture of Carl Rogers, Carl Rogers, and I've mentioned him a few times. And, uh, He's probably one of the psychologists that was most responsible for this kind of shift of psychology towards what we would call counseling, right? And he was really big on this idea of who you are as the therapist, that who you are as a therapist matters. It's not just about having like a great theory, right? I kind of shared a young quote related to this last in the part I recorded yesterday that like part of what. Part of being a therapist is understanding the, understand, the underlying theory and the dynamics of psychology, but another part is being able to be a real person with somebody else when they're in a difficult spot. It's like you're attempting to enter their private perceptual world. It's, while you're doing that, you're being sensitive to the to their felt meaning. So, like that's an interesting way of saying it, right? Like what it means to them, what their subjective or their their felt meaning is right you're like well that doesn't mean that it's like well hang on a sec because you're not at that stage yet you're at the stage of trying to understand their experience it's like you're entering their perceptual world trying to understand what things mean to them it's like you're temporarily living in their life moving about it right so he's saying this is all like an advanced type of cognitive exercise it's basically like your brains you're basically not daydreaming but you're hearing the person talk and you're trying to create in your mind this idea of what it would be like to be them and you're trying to actually hear them. You're trying to maybe even notice meanings that are, I say they're scarcely aware to them or that they're scarcely aware of, like that they, they might not even notice the connections yet. Right, but you gotta be careful with that. I say they're number five, that it's not your role, especially near the beginning to try to like point out things like, oh, that sounds like that's because of how your dad was or blah, blah, blah. Cause it's like, you have no idea if the person's ready to hear something like that. And you might just throw them down a whole other path that's not like those big reveals have to you have to be careful with that kind of stuff that's a tough thing right it's psychology is can be difficult and especially therapeutic psychology everyone wants to be therapeutic and have therapeutic effects on people but sometimes that means meeting people when they're in their deepest darkest spots and sometimes what people need in those scenarios is for you to be a normal person and not to be, you know, Johnny Johnny New Theory or whatever, right? And be like, oh, I got, I know what that is. That's this. And you should do this. And it's like, that person might have almost canceled the meeting. They might have doubted if they wanted to do it. They might have barely kept that piece of hope that made them come to the meeting. And that has to be nurtured. Okay, so now we're talking about Carl Rogers. I'm getting back in my groove. Carl Rogers, get me back in the groove because he gets to the heart of it. It's uh, you want to be a therapist. Well, let's work on you as a person and your ability to have genuine relationships with people that are based on an authentic, positive regard. And it all starts with who you are not what your theory says I wanted to hit you with with these three quotes these are pretty cool quotes from rogers about this topic of empathy to my mind empathy itself is a healing agent so that's an interesting point right like when people feel understood it's like something about that itself is healing it's one of the most potent aspects of therapy because it releases it confirms and brings even the most frightened client into the human race, right? Because people feel like their problem is so unique and so specifically them and the people knew they would hate them. And part of what empathy does is allow people to 
Well, it brings even the most frightened client into the human race. If a person can be understood, they can belong. He says in another point in his book on becoming, empathy is a way of being with another person. And this is where it's like in our current society, we kind of use this word empathic to mean like just like super emotional or whatever. But it's like that's not actually what it means. It means like your ability to actually consider what it would be like to me and then understand how you're interacting with me through that prism. It's actually a lot of cognitive work. Rogers emphasized that we actually need to sense or imagine. Sense is an interesting word, right? In how it relates to the idea of sensations. You're not actually literally seeing it, but you have to almost sense it. like Almost like you are seeing the private world as if it's yours. Without forgetting that as if. Right? Because if you get lost in the client's problems, it's actually disrespectful. It's like... One of the most interesting things about psychology is you can't bring your clients' problems home with you. They're their problems. You can help them get better at dealing with them. But unless you want to burn out in the first couple months of your practice, you have to develop an ability to. And it's the hardest thing. It's one of the hardest things in this kind of work. Because you want to help people. And the reality is that a lot of people that are in really tough scenarios, if you were to really help them, you'd have to get super involved. And sometimes it would stretch beyond a 50-minute session once a week. And that's tough. So you kind of have to do your role in the scenario. And again, it's tough. It's like Rogers would say, like, if you're a therapist, one of the biggest things you are is a professional problem solver. You're helping people develop strategies to move forward. Because oftentimes what people experience is anxiety and depression is related to not having a clear path forward. Obviously, there's biochemical aspects to it. But that... One thing Roger said is that that's one of the reasons you need to kind of meet where the person's at because they're in their very own unique social dynamic. And their problems live in that dynamic. You lay aside your views. Oh darn, I was going to try to do that all proper and I messed up the first line. You lay aside your own views. And values in order to enter another person's world without prejudice without prejudging in some sense it means that you lay aside yourself this can only be done by persons who are secure enough in themselves that they will know that they will not get lost in what in what may turn out to be the strange or bizarre world of the other and that they can comfortably return to their own world whenever they wish this is an interesting quote right because he's talking about this idea that this is a mental skill it's like i'm able to Imagine what it's like to be you, but I don't actually lose my sense of myself and identity. I'm, st I'm still fully me. And if this sounds like a, a weird point, I would argue to you that a lot of therapists make mistakes of getting too involved with clients. And it often comes in, at least initially, from a place of you know, wanting to help but that your role is to help them become more fully functioning in their own world. That's Roger's big word, fully functioning. Help people kind of get out of the way of their own defense mechanisms so they can be their, their fullest version of self. And on that note, I'm going to have to finish this presentation tonight because the baby monitor is going off because Charlotte is up. I will see you. Well, to you, this will just seem like another slide change. But I'll start recording the next one later tonight. Hope you're doing well, my friends. Talk to you soon. Recording presentations like this is kind of interesting because it's weirdly, like, not intimate and very intimate at the same time. Like, it's like you're literally in my basement with me talking about, like, and I'm talking about, you know, personal stuff sometimes. And... Over the years, I've, I've developed a lot of, like, trust and quite a bit of liking towards Nipissing students. So, as you can maybe tell, and maybe I do it too much, I try to be honest. And part of that's because I know it's been a difficult few years for, for some people. And, and for some people, it has, and some people are doing really well. And and, and if you are, then that's an, that's an amazing blessing, and it's important to show gratitude 
and thank the people that have helped you and continue doing the processes that are making you successful. And it's like, for a lot of people that are, they've been, these last few years have maybe made you question a bit who you are and what you think and who, you, all kinds of stuff, right? And One of the things about recording a presentation like this, I was going to say, is that like, I do it over sometimes a couple days, right? Like, as you can tell, like now it's nighttime. So now it's like I'm starting this last segment and I'm probably going to like, I'll be able to do the rest tonight. I only have about 20 more slides, so that's easily a night's work. Um, I'll probably do this within the next hour or so and then get it out to you for tomorrow for Friday. But what it means when you're doing it over a couple of days is you end up thinking about it a lot. It's kind of interesting. It's like I recorded a bit, then I recorded a bit, then I recorded a bit. And I had like, and if you're going to do it like that, PowerPoint's definitely the best because then at least I'm like, you know, I'm staying fresh within the slide at least, hopefully. And anyways, without getting off point too much. You know, these last few years have almost been like the opposite of CBT for people. It's like, you know, without being political in either direction, it's like this, this constant focus on things that are outside of our control. Worrying massively about things that we can't influence. It'd be exactly what you would tell someone not to do in a CBT session. So anyways, that's what I was just thinking about on my walk with Charlotte, trying to get my crying baby to sleep. But yeah, she's not really crying. She doesn't cry nearly as much as my first baby. But she's just, she's been home this week sick, kind of sick. She's got like, I don't know, just a bit of a gastral upset, like, like diarrhea or whatever but like oh, she's a great kid and she like we go on the best walks it's like basically the best part of my life sometimes going on walks with my girls it's like okay so anyways mike cognitive behavioral therapy let's get into this cognitive behavioral therapy we're going to talk about the work of aaron beck here so you might have kind of already got this vibe for me, but I kind of like to defend and shout out the classics. And like Aaron Beck is absolutely the most really put on the map this idea of using cognitive psychology to look at things like depression. Oh, I forgot to put my music back on. I don't know if you like that or not, but again, it's like to do with the computer home. Um, and and to be honest, I just I kind of like it. It makes me a vibe. But I think on the couple of slides, I had it a little too loud, and I'll try to get that better. So Aaron Beck had this idea, right? Like that the way people think about their situation influences the way that they feel and behave. And Aaron Beck's cognitive psychology, which is about to kind of down the road historically, then gets developed basically into CPT, right? Aaron Beck does in his book on cognitive therapy that you're seeing a picture of there, he really lays out a lot of the, the, the theoretical foundation that's core to CBT, right? And this idea of not focusing on just like the root or the cause of a problem, but on helping clients understand and kind of problem solve and create new schemas or new new mental perspectives that can help them respond and think of things in a more healthy way. The way people think about their situation influences how they feel and how they behave. Cognitive behavioral. Right? And there's this emotional aspect too, right? It's not really Aaron Beck would say that your emotions are largely cognitive and biochemical. He's kind of from that era.
So you'd say like your emotions are definitely part of this, but then we're going to get into, I'm going to show you in a second, a different approach called rational emotive behavioral therapy, which is sort of like a more intent, the same kind of idea as CBT, but then a more intentional inclusion of this emotive or this like uh, emotional, right? You feel things that are the result of these emotions or these. Oh, I'm all of a sudden getting trying to get like all deep about what emotion is, but it's interesting, right? Like what's the difference between the word feeling and emotion? Like, is it that you just feel emotions? I'll leave that question with you. Next slide. This is a long dramatic pause to start the slide. Sorry, <clears throat> I don't know why I did that. I was just, I kind of got caught between wanting to make two points. I was going to start this first point, but then I just thought of something that's similar. That's an interesting point. Maybe <clears throat> growing up, my hero was Bruce Lee. Like my head spun for months after seeing the movie Game of Death. I'd never seen anything like that. It's hard in hindsight to think of what. I like spent so I did my PhD on Kung Fu. It's like I had never seen someone do a jump kick. It blew my mind. Like and Bruce Lee was so cool because he was Bruce Lee quote right here on my wall, the consciousness of self is the greatest hindrance, the proper execution of all physical action. It's like he was a philosopher, he was a Taoist philosopher, movie star, martial artist. It's just you know, the world lost that guy way too early. But the reason I'm bringing Bruce Lee up is... And I ask my Kitchener students, and sometimes I'll be like... There'll be a hundred people in the room, and I'll say, like, how many of you have heard of Bruce Lee? And the numbers are getting less and less. It's like... Oh, I, oh, at least watch Dragon. Dragon's like an awesome movie that's kind of like a story about his life and it's like very watchable it's like very much like a, a a regular movie bruce lee's stuff is like well he's in a bunch of stuff but and he was in a show called green hornet too he played the uh kind of like the robin character to to the green hornet the green hornet was like the main guy or batman and then he, bruce lee was like i think his name was kato in the show so anyways, such a long-winded way of just getting to my point. So that's just the author of the quote I'm about to say. But what Bruce Lee used to say, and this is an important part or point to add to your life, is like sometimes when sometimes you have to train your body to train your mind. Sometimes you have to train your mind to train your body. And sometimes that's his quote, something like that. I freestyled that. But... How I'm going to link it to this is like, this is the idea that's central to Aaron Beck's idea. Like, sometimes if you're in a really bad mood and you're upset about something, especially if it's a problem that you still don't have a solution to, you might not be able to think your way out of that scenario. And what I mean isn't that you won't be able to think of an answer, but what I mean is you might not be able to think your way out of that mood. And you not being able to think your way out of that mood might actually be what's making you not able to find the answer that you seek. This 528 music, I feel like I'm giving some kind of speech, but no, it's like, it's actually like pretty deep, right? Because it's basically saying like, if you can change your thinking, it, it will affect your behavior and your emotions or if you can change your behavior so this is my point is like if you're sitting in that negative mental space it's like take the bruce lee and the carl jung advice go for a walk go for a walk spend some time outside go do something different change your mood change your you know we can say this more scientifically change your your underlying chemistry That's been like a big thing I've been learning in my life like this last year is if me if I'm having trouble getting my daughter to sleep, if I'm having trouble with whatever, it's like Oh, well, let's get the stroller. It's time to time to do another lap of the neighborhood. It's like to 
train the mind, train the body, to train the body, train the mind. And it's a recognition of the dynamicness of your system, that you're actually a super complex thing. You're a human being. You're actually like this embodied organism, meaning like you're a physical thing. You're one thing that has thoughts and that has motivations and has desires and has a whole memory system that's completely unique and has a social world that's completely unique and has a fears and and so since you're so complicated a change and a tweak to anywhere in the system has this butterfly effect ripple right so if you're in a, in a bad emotional thinking space well maybe take me up on my challenge put an hour uh, on the road every night this week go for a walk for an hour a long walk Bring your podcast or music and see if that doesn't change you. Don't have any goals. This isn't, you know, it's good fitness, but this isn't a fitness exercise. This is a mental health thing. Carl Jung may be the greatest psychologist ever. My personal favorite, probably. It depends what I mean by favorite. The one I find most intellectually stimulating. It's like, he, my, my favorite you would say that like well that few things have cured more people than a good long walk that's definitely not word for word is quote but that's see that's my, my wife gets so mad at me because like i'll be like yeah you said this and then they said this and she's like that's not what i said it's like i remember the gist i don't remember i'm not never good at word for word um but And this is like such a key of whether you're working with people or whether it's talking about you yourself. How do you get out of your routes? How do you, or how do you get out of your ruts? It's like not by doing the same thing. Sometimes you have to force a change. And yeah, okay. So I think I made this point. Okay, next slide. Like if you look at this, I thought that this is a kind of cool diagram and then your amazingly tech savvy teacher added the extra red arrows but no i just wanted to because they don't have everything connected right and the situation obviously affects behavior and the situation affects the physical aspect right your situation doesn't just affect your thoughts and that so many of our attempts to explain human behavior fall short because we're over focusing on one of these aspects we're over focusing on emotions or we're over focusing on the cognitive decision making aspect of behavior we're over focusing on physical reactions like perhaps a stress reaction and that these things are all dynamically in, in and and our behavior is often shaped by situational factors too and that your situation is affecting all these things and it's basically saying like your engagement with your world is complex Right, so I'm setting myself up for a transition here. The great, the weird, and I say that lovingly because I think Albert Ellis is, a, it's an easy case to make that he's a bit weird if you watch some of his videos. And it's like, I mean weird in like the kind of eccentric or whatever professor way. I actually think he'd be an amazing lecturer to listen to. He's an interesting person. A lot of the videos are sort of time dated right like some of the stuff's a bit older so some of the you might find some of the footage of him like a bit slow just kind of old school interviews but my feeling from him is that he probably really shined in the classroom and he was a and in the therapy actual therapy right like he was like definitely a hardcore actual therapist hardcore just meaning like an actual professional therapist i would really highly recommend even just for historical value at some point, looking at that book, Better, Deeper, and More Enduring. I think about that, it's like he's trying to talk about the therapeutic process. It's like that's what everybody theoretically would want, right? Like how to make your, how to make you, sorry, how to make your therapy better, how to make the experience of the client deeper, and how to make the effects more enduring, right? Enduring meaning like lasting over time. This rational emotive behavioral therapy approach. 
So for this slide, I would just really like you to like maybe copy down some of the, you know, to write the Albert Ellis reader, but especially that bit better, deeper, and more enduring. And then also the Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy Therapist Guide, like the two books on the left. And I think like, because first of all, just uh, just to add to your note, and also just because those would be awesome ones to check out at some point. He's a brilliant thinker. And uh, well, you'll notice that in the Giants of Psychology assignment, he was one of the people on the list. <laughs> so now let me just break down this word for you, right? In case this is the first time you've come across it, which it very might, very well likely may not be. You may have had a teacher already tell you about him. I was, I kind of was influenced by him. I just found that his books, you know how sometimes you read a book and it's like written about a topic or whatever and it's interesting and you're into it and then you read books sometimes that feel like they're not written to you but written to people like you and I mean that like you not in terms of anything other than just people curious in this about the same things you are. Like he would just say th like I would like laugh and sometimes when reading his stuff and it like laugh because of a joke that he said that it was like like actually funny and it was funny and it was deep and it was connected to all these things and it was like and I was learning and I just I don't know I found him an interesting person it works for me it can work for you that's like what it says on the middle book but that was kind of his idea right that we can get trapped in these like ideas and one of the problems with like labeling certain mental health things is that it, this is what he would have said is that It becomes a definitional way of talking about the thing and it starts to like become this umbrella that now everything fits under that and it's like okay we need to be way harsher on ourselves in some ways and way easier on ourselves in other ways it's like we're really harsh on ourselves in some ways is in terms of like how we do self-talk and doubt ourselves and like pick apart at things but then we're like really easy on the part of our brain that does that we like somehow don't challenge that we're like super critical of ourselves we're not critical of the part that's critical it's like he says that's like the fundamental mistake well i don't know if he says that, that i just kind of said that i'm trying to think of how he thinks and that's what i would say the fundamental point is is what i should have i should have said it like that and that's kind of his idea is that you're both taking yourself too seriously and not seriously enough And so he would have, do interviews and say comments like that and people would be like what do you mean by that and then he that's like an actual and interesting conversational way that a lot of these guys that you find really or guys or girls that you find really appealing when you're listening to it's actually a, a conversational technique to like say things that are like that almost demand the person to ask what you mean by that and then keep going okay so anyways i don't know why i'm saying that but that's what podcasters do good podcasters do constantly is they segue for each other okay and uh he would say so do so so does a good therapist client relationship right you're actually trying the more high quality that conversation becomes the more likely you're going to be able to develop solutions or whatever find therapeutic problems so i still haven't done this yet so rational emotive behavior therapy right Let's just break it down for a sec. You obviously know what behavior means, right? You obviously know what therapy means. Emotive means like emotions, right? Rational. So usually we would, the other style I just showed you was cognitive behavioral therapy, but part of your cognitive system is your ability to rationally make sense of things, right? So if we're talking about your how rational you're being, that's, it's kind of, so basically what I'm saying, it's like kind of like the C of CBT, your rationality is a component of your cognition and then emotive is kind of so it's kind of similar to CBT in a way even though the name's different but with the inclusion of this specific focus on the emotive or the emotional layer I think Ellis is I should look, should look this up before I just say this but I think his work would have predated CBT as an actual term people use right but cbt is basically an, an 
what's evolved out of a lot of the cognitive psychology approaches of people like Aaron Beck. And so its roots predate Ellis. But just, you know, what happened with CBT is actually really interesting because CBT is effective. And if you've ever had therapy yourself, and if you do it in the future, you'll probably use CBT techniques. And one of the reasons is like, if your work's paying for, or if you're a student and you get like eight sessions through your school or something like that, it's like psychoanalysts would sometimes meet like multiple times a week. It's an expensive thing. There's a lot of psychoanalysts out there still. And psychoanalysis can be highly effective in a lot of things, especially dealing with like really serious trauma and really deep stuff. But uh, one of the advantages of CBT is it's super effective with thought-based issues, right? So like, and, and rational motive therapy. So I'd say that cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive therapies, rational motive therapies, these are all kind of things that are kind of have bubbled and kind of crystallized in this CBT in a way, right? Trying to just give a little bit of the, the history there. So let me explain some of these concepts. So this is called the ABC model, and you may have been exposed to it before. And I want to try to, even if you have, I want to try to present this in a, in a slightly, hopefully different way. Say so you're going into class and nipsing. Say you, you have class in person now, I hear, so that's pretty awesome. And so you're in class. And, uh, you know, when you go to leave class, you, st you start to walk back out to your car. Let's just, for the purpose of this story, I'm freestyling. Let's pretend that you drove there, right? So you, you start to go to your car and then on your walk to your car, you get this message and you look down on your phone. Let's just say that you have your buzzer on your phone. You look down on your phone and it's a message from your boss and it just says, where are you? which is a super anxiety provoking message to get from a boss. Then you realize, oh yeah, you told your co-worker you were going to cover this shift and now you're all of a sudden a bit panicked and then you realize that you actually owe someone at work money too so you quick check your bank account and realize that you have like but you forgot that this was when amazon prime day comes off or whatever and it's like you your yearly fee to something came off so you have less money than you thought and then you get a message from your boyfriend or girlfriend and they're upset about something now you're like in this frantic state you get in your car you start to drive out somebody cuts you off and all of a sudden you're slamming on your horn you're super mad this is like just another example of how everything never works out or on that walk to your car you know you get a message from your boyfriend or girlfriend that says they love you and appreciate you and they hope you're having a good day or they just send you like some funny joke and you realize like your boss maybe calls and says you know, we've decided to give you a raise. And then you get to your car and you realize you have like, I don't know, a chocolate bar sitting in there that you forgot about. You're just on cloud nine. You turn on the radio. It's your favorite car. I mean, it's your favorite car. It's your favorite uh, song. Then you start to drive away and someone cuts you off in traffic and you're like, ah, that's annoying. But whatever, you just like kind of switch lanes and forget about it. There's just someone making a dumb driving mistake has nothing to do with you it's nothing to do with some broader philosophy of the fairness of the universe and if you follow me through that long example i was trying to kind of make this point that he said the activating event in both those stories is the same in both those stories what that car cut the person off something happened an, an activating event is what he called it now the consequence slamming on your horn chasing the guy down the road like what are you gonna chase a person off the road are you gonna kill somebody because they cut you off in traffic like you're a reasonable person we talk about it regression so it's like but there's but it's because what ellis would say the belief system you were holding in that moment in that moment you were upset in that moment you were in this negative place this was another example Right? Whereas in the second scenario, you're not in that mindset. Things are going pretty good. That person cutting you off gets understood within a different belief system. Therefore, you respond differently. And you say, that was annoying. 
But who cares? I'm enjoying this chocolate bar. The belief system affects the consequence of the activating event. Right, so you could say, okay, both those people had a negative event. One had a rational or like a more kind of thought of like this was annoying, but like in the broader scheme of things, who cares? And yes, it's easier to be rational when you're not upset. That's kind of another topic that we'll touch on in an upcoming presentation that I'm going to do for you called Hot Cognition. But that, you know, running the incident through that worldview leads to a more healthy negative emotion, right? You can still be mad that the person did it, but your mad levelness is relatively low and it's more at the level of annoyed. Or you can have that negative event. You can have this irrational belief system that it gets filtered through that this is just another example of how everything's out to get you. And that's an, then you can have an unhealthy negative emotion. So I wanted to show you this at this just this image I found online of it. Sometime I've had this image for a while, but both of those are negative res emotional responses. But else kind of stresses this idea: there's a good and a bad negative, a healthy and an unhealthy negative. Is a better way to say it. Okay, so for the last kind of section of this presentation there's a couple little videos I have in here and also it's what I often will do with the videos is I try to pick videos to sort of express and maybe go a little bit further on like a really related point hopefully to what I'm talking about um, to sort of hopefully make it interesting for you and sort of also to contextualize things and show how things relate to each other Threats to critical thinking, and what I mean by this is like one of the issues around mental health is when we start living the lie a bit, right? And we can be like in this negative mindset. And the problem is, is if like we believe everyone doesn't like us, then we act like people don't like us, then you're acting like someone that believes everyone doesn't like you, and that's not like super likable, and then people actually like maybe avoid you more, and then it's like almost a self fulfilling prophecy. It's like how. And it's based on an inaccurate read in the first place. It's like part of mental health is, is this ability to kind of, well, have cognitive autonomy and be able to like accurately perceive your experience. And I want to lay out here what I'm kind of recognizing or presenting as these threats to that. So I, I think you'll, I hope you'll find this interesting. Now the other part I think I'm trying to do with this is like, So much of mental health is about having control of your own thoughts and control over your own mind and being honest with yourself. And because when you're not, because when you're not being honest with yourself, even if you deeply deny it, there's a part of you that notices it, and there's a taxing element to that. It's a heavy burden at some kind of deep level. And so, you know, I can't, I don't understand the specific situations of your life or your feelings on a variety of issues, but like, one thing I would say is that, well, these are, this is going to be kind of my point to you, is that I would say that if one of your goals is to have as much control of your own thinking as possible, it's important to be aware of the common mistakes people make in terms of how they're making sense of the reality. And a big one is around this idea of emotional decision making. I say there that emotions can and should play a part in a lot of decisions in your life. But it becomes problematic when it gets when it locks us into these negative outcome loops. Right? Or when it gets us like too committed to irrational positions. Right, because what's the problem? Is the problem that you're emotional? Well, no, but it's like, if the goal is cognitive autonomy, control of your mind, your own control of your own mind, then we need to know that when we're making, when we're upset, we're making poor decisions. 
and uh, not just when we're not just when we're upset like from that last slide it's also like just when we're that's why I like I use the term later in the course hot cognition like when that when your cognitive system's like charged up and it, sometimes it's from arousal sometimes it's from fear sometimes it is about anger or being upset And I thought you'd find this picture kind of cool because you can actually kind of see these systems. But this system one, this kind of real fast response. There's an interesting video or an interesting book called like Thinking. It's called Thinking Fast and Working Slow. Or I forget what it is, but it's like talking about these two brain systems, right? You have a certain brain system that or this more what we're calling here the default mode network the old brain that does this like rapid processing and is more automatic more emotional you can make an interesting case about like what's the difference between the words automatic and unconscious i think they are different but i think they're deeply connected right automatic almost is like when you learn something so much that it kind of dips into unconscious control it's like And if I like throw a ball to you and you're an athlete, you're going to catch it. You're not going to think about how far apart your hands are when you catch it. You're just going to catch it. You're not going to catch it way too hard. You're not going to catch it so fast. Like you're going to catch it with a lot of precision that you're just going to in a split second do. This is our, our hardwired default mode network performs when stressed. Right, so this is a lot of the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate. And then system two, this newer brain, you know, in, in quotes, it's more evolved the prefrontal cortex area, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex specifically, right, involved in slower processing, more deliberate, thoughtful things. Right, like think, even just think about me and my wife like to watch Amazing Race, Canada, and it's like in that show that basically is a show about getting people flustered and then having them do System Two style issues, right? Like, okay, now that you're super stressed and have been running and everybody's in a big race, now do this super complicated puzzle and it's like, whoa, that's actually way harder than like doing something physical, right? And it's like. Not just puzzle, but they'll do like, well, if you've ever seen Amazing Race, it's like basically all kinds of challenges. It's a pretty fun show. I'll admit that I like that show. It's a cool show. It's like one of the shows me and my wife look forward to watching. It's these two brain systems. And so when we're upset, we're going to be being overwhelmed by this default mode network. And why that matters is because it's interfering with some of this more high-end processing that's more associated with the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. With the quote-unquote new brain. Distortion, right? You see Homer sitting here and he's like, <clears throat> what's distortion? Distortion is like you're trying to hear something and it's like the signal's like interrupted. You're not like hearing it clearly or whatever. <clears throat> And this is kind of applied in a visual sense, right? Homer's looking at himself all huge and, and built. Now, the I, I've used that image for a long time because I don't know, students sometimes think it's... Well, everyone knows Homer. The sad part about it is that in almost all cases, it's going to be in the opposite direction, right? That people are seeing themselves as like less... Right. This is kind of uh, like if you're seeing yourself in the mirror is better than even you are like this. This is distortion because or, or, or like a yeah, distortion in in. Well, yes, yeah, I'll just like instead of just freestyling a definition, I'll just read this that distortion results from misinterpretations, faulty assumptions and cultural biases. Right? It's like we're not, we're adding interpretive layers that are actually interfering with seeing the actual thing. The extreme form of this delusional thinking would involve holding beliefs that have no basis in reality. And actually not just holding those beliefs, but having those beliefs be an interpretive lens. 
that you're actually like wearing those beliefs as glasses and everything that you're looking at is through those beliefs right which is again it's like why am i making comments about this because i'm saying like that's the distortion of your reality and if you're in a and i keep saying you but like you or people you're working with in the future are in a bad place emotionally or mentally there's often especially if that bad place is related to how you feel about yourself and how you think about yourself and how you feel about your worth and things like that there's probably some distortion at play right because this also leads into this idea that like humans have a negativity bias it's like you put something on youtube you can make a video and put it on youtube and like 50 people say it's great and one person says oh this person's got such an annoying voice and then you just go to bed at night like oh my god my voice is terrible it's like that's a negativity bias and that's linked to the fact that's even deeper that's linked to the fact that like we're human beings that for entire evolution as social animals being denied by the group has been incredibly dangerous so there's this want to belong this need to belong so I, one of the reasons why public speaking is so intimidating, right? Because you're like risking getting judged by the group. But then you master that biology and you realize like, okay, you don't, just because you're feeling nervous, like the biggest point about presentation skills is just because you're feeling nervous doesn't mean you can't do your presentation. It just means that your biology is ready and that's why i call it like the idea of like mastering or controlling or, or harnessing those emotions distortion so this is another one right so like so these are all threats to you accurately seeing it's like only focusing on certain things or only focusing on things that kind of confirm what you want to think about me or you or people or situations or right selectively paying attention to things so for example i have there and that's a devastating point that like people with low self-esteem will often underestimate evidence of their successes right so this is that one of the reasons why like sometimes people that are depressed especially if depression low self-esteem which are not always connected but sometimes are when, when those are connected it can be difficult because not only is the person depressed they're also in a distorted way selectively attending to only certain cues they're getting in their social world especially cues around being rejected and they're responding more to those and they're devaluing evidence of things going better right like people actually trying to be nice oh they're just being nice because of whatever insert bad reason so that selective attention is actually keeping can keep us in bad places this selective attention errors uh or these errors arise from a failure to look at all aspects of a problem yeah selectively only looking at parts instead of looking at the whole thing This is a tough one. It's definitely been hard at times, especially you know in life in general, but over the past few years, especially for me to like not spend time worrying and like ruminating, just basically like thinking over and over and over about the same thing. But it's like, there's a point where that can become unhealthy. And it's like, this gets back to my walk thing. The point from before is like trying to break out of those cycles of sort of this kind of helplessness and pessimism we can get in and i'm not saying that it's all behavioral but i am saying that there's an aspect of that that this that it's i'm not saying also that worrying is like bad but it can be unhelpful especially at the points you can get to and it might involve you know dwelling on like past things that are sort of out of our control or on future things that well as i say there may never actually even happen the fact that you worry about things is like and the fact that people experience anxiety is completely understandable psychologically it makes complete sense it's the same reason why most of your dreams are anxiety based something like 60 percent of them are 
you know, that's obviously just a guesstimate. But like, survival-wise, it makes complete sense that your thought system would be obsessed with keeping you out of danger, especially from an evolutionary perspective. It's, it's also heavily related to why you have the memory system that you have. But again, that just because that there's an evolutionary reason why we act in these ways when we're overwhelmed doesn't mean that it's necessarily helping us. And sometimes, whether it's a friend or just getting out for a bit, going for a walk and letting nature do its thing, and this kind of gets to the Albert Ellis point. Sometimes you have to be really like almost tough on yourself, but not on yourself on the part because you're not talking about your self who you truly are we're talking about like that part of your mind that's like the internal critic why is why is why are you being critical about every part of your life except your tendency to criticize yourself it's like that's actually the one that this is else's point that's the one that if you could if you could address properly will be the game changer it's just when i dad joke city here why do you make a mountain out of a molehill every time we argue right this is like the idea. Harold this idea of like making a mountain out of a molehill is like a really old saying that basically means like don't turn like a little thing into a massive thing it's like we're having an argument about who's gonna do the dishes and all of a sudden you're talking about like all oh, this is just, we're bringing up like family stuff and like it's like whoa how do we get to like this like super deep argument we're like talking about like something that's simple it's like or that's like that's a that's a exaggerating a magnification there's also the minimization factor right like not taking things that are a big deal as big deals tough because trying to pick how to say this well the last few years have been tough with this right it's like lots of things have been magnified but also lots of things have been minimized and again it's like what's my underlying point are you accurately seeing your reality are you experiencing cognitive autonomy so then this other idea i wanted to say is like another common error arises when we try to like assume we know what other people are thinking or feeling i obviously don't mean like mind reading like reading like david blaine or like some like i don't know magician that's trying to guess what card but what i mean is Although that's it. really interesting how that works too, right? How they can like kind of make forced choices. I mean, magicians are really interesting. And if you're interested in psychology, it's it wouldn't surprise me if you're also interested in magic, right? Because magic is like a massive play on your sensory system, right? Because basically most magic tricks are a combination of incredible, especially card stuff, a combination of incredible eye hand speed of the magician and their understanding of how your expectations work and those expectations are almost all visual um and how the mind likes to recognize patterns and assume that if this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened then this is going to happen often that's where the, the trick is or whatever but yeah this idea of mind reading i don't know why sorry i'm this is getting late at night. I'm going to wrap this up soon. But now all of a sudden I'm like on some rant about magic. Mind reading frequently arises from our insecurities. For example, this is an important point. People with low self-esteem will often interpret a relatively regular interaction with someone as more rejecting than it, than someone with higher self-esteem would. 
right? So not that it wasn't rejecting or whatever, but it's like if you have two people and they both experience a situation and they have a difference in self-esteem, it will affect how much they experience that as a, a sign of rejection. Right, so it's that's interesting, right? Because I'm saying like what they're bringing to the situation affects how they see the situation, and well, they're if the goal is accurately seeing the world, and getting away from some of our defenses that may no longer be serving us. Then again, this is why this is number six on our list of threats to your critical thinking. So this is one that, to be completely blunt and honest, probably some of you struggle with sometimes, right? You want to, you're in a competitive school environment. You want to do well. It's completely understandable. And the hard thing is, is that it's almost like the, the perfect scenario would be if you could push yourself as hard as possible and then can immediately, once you've submitted the assignment or whatever, kind of just let it go and move to the next thing. Because as soon as it becomes not under your direct control, it's almost like the reward on investment or return on investment for your worrying gets less and less. Right? And sometimes, yeah, this focus on like having to be perfect at everything can actually get in the way of you being good at other things, right? Maybe you become so focused on making sure that paper's perfect, and maybe you get a 98 instead of a 94. And maybe that's on one assignment out of six in one out of your six classes that term, and you take... So I'm just trying to make the point that okay, spread out over all your classes, it might actually not statistically move your overall average a whole percentage point in either, either direction. But in the in the goal of being perfect at that, you might have, you know, sacrificed other things in your life. And obviously, like doing things that are difficult and meaningful involves certain amounts of sacrifice. But my point is that like. Sometimes that 92 is great. And it's all good to set high goals and it's actually something that you should be doing and you should be writing them down. But that uh, focusing on it too much can actually lead to this like increased anxiety and actually lower performance. My dad used to say it's like sports are hard enough you can't also guard yourself i think that's an awesome saying it's like say if i'm out like playing hockey or something and i'm like doubting myself and i'm like it's almost like i'm playing a bit of defense on myself it's like i'm helping the other team stop me this is true in like a lot of non-sports scenarios too it's like life's tough enough there's no need for you to be overly self-defeating it's like and I'm not laughing at that. That's it's a deep problem that a lot of people and a lot of us deal with, right? Is this idea of like not being rational and how critical we are of ourselves. And like realizing like, yeah, everyone has things that they're weak at and everybody has things that they're strong at. And, you know, everybody's, there's massive differences between people. But we have this tendency as human beings to kind of over-focus on things that we find weak about ourselves which you know if if you're in this kind of place of growth where that's then turning into actions designed to address those weaknesses then that can be that's one thing but when those weaknesses then become the focus of dwelling right and all the negative thinking about that this is just kind of a tie back to ellis right and our abt that argues that people's belief system influences how they're responding to and understanding events, right? So people have very negative belief systems and especially around how they view themselves and how they view their worth. That's going to affect how they understand things. And when there's these unrealistic shoulds, like my life should be like this and I should do this and I should be like this to these people and I should be like that, that feeling of what you should be doing and knowing that you're not doing that well that can 
say there that they're likely to experience emotional anxiety or disturbance. One of the biggest ideas from cognitive behavioral therapy is, and from REBT is that one of the most proactive and 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 psycho not proactive necessarily well proactive yeah but also that's not the word I meant. The most psychologically protective skill you can learn is getting better at calling yourself out when your thoughts get kind of garbagey. That wasn't the best way of saying it, but like when you start being unrealistically cruel to yourself, notice it. It's going to be hard to stop. But in CBT, you would say like the first step is to start to notice it and then start to notice how that pattern develops and start to notice what leads to that pattern. And as you start to understand the pattern more, your ability to set aside the pattern increases. You start to understand this. And... Sorry for the yawn. It's like 1130 here. I'm an old guy. I'm getting, getting ready for sleepy time. Got a few more slides here. I'm enjoying this. I actually hope that you find this kind of interesting. But yeah, thought stopping is this key idea in so cognitive behavioral therapy that actually like you have to, if you actually want to like help yourself and improve the quality of your mental life you have to get better at stopping yourself from going down patterns of thought and patterns of worry and rumination that you've seen before and that you know where those paths are going so thought stopping is a technique for interrupting these repetitive unhelping unhelpful thinking patterns and and it starts to that can impede action or that can get in your way of you basically living your life right and to replace that with more confident and positive empowering solutions after identifying negative self-talk clients need to develop positive statements to replace intrusive negative thoughts right like negative thoughts that you don't want to have what does discipline really mean? You know, besides waking up early and how do I employ it to all aspects of my life? What does it really mean? Yes, discipline, it, it, it does start with waking up early. It really does. But that is just the beginning. And I always say that discipline is the root of all good qualities. But you have to absolutely apply it to things outside of just waking up early. It's, it's everything. It's working out every day, making yourself stronger and faster and more flexible and healthier. Discipline is eating the right foods to fuel your system. It, it's about disciplining your emotions so you can make good decisions. It's about having the discipline to control your ego so your ego doesn't get out of hand and control you. It's about treating people the way you would want to be treated and, and doing the tasks that you don't necessarily want to do but that you know will help you or help your team. It's about facing your fears. It takes discipline to face your fears so you can conquer them. And that's what discipline is. Discipline means taking the hard road, the uphill road to do what's right for yourself and for other people. It's so often the easy path the easy path that calls to us to be weak for that moment to break down for that moment to give in to the desire and the short term gratification but the discipline will not allow that the discipline calls for strength and fortitude and will it won't accept weakness. It won't tolerate another breakdown. The discipline 
can seem like it's your worst enemy. But the reality is, discipline is your best friend. It will take care of you like nothing else can. And it'll put you on that path. The path to strength and health and intelligence and happiness. And most importantly, it'll put you on that path to freedom. So mindfulness is another common practice in CBT and mindfulness has almost been like talked about so much that I feel like, I don't know, I hope you don't find it boring or like, oh, you've heard this a million times. The idea behind mindfulness is actually pretty deep. And I don't mean deep in terms of like necessarily hard, hard to understand, but it's deep in the sense that it gets to the core of who we are as people that a lot of our anxieties and a lot of our fears and a lot of our worries live in the in the future, right? And there are things that we tend to think about and worry about that might happen and a lot of our kind of emotional trauma and a lot of the things that will live in our past, right? So a lot of our mental anguish is worrying about things that hap that might happen and dwelling on things that have happened and mindfulness is almost this idea that there's a therapeutic element of being present in the moment and being mindful it's, it's not like it comes from buddhist meditation and there's sort of two general trends towards like some types of meditation where you're trying almost to empty your mind and then there's some types of meditation where you're trying to fill your mind but you're trying to fill your mind with like maybe in mind there's different types of mindfulness but maybe you're doing some some kind of mantra or you're focusing on a word or on a sound or you're trying to you know what i what i would do is like i even like the idea of like if you're trying to relax like just picture yourself picture in your mind like a blank white board and you just write picture yourself writing the number one on it and then in and maybe in black marker and then the number two and then the number three and try to picture it completely and as fully as possible and then as soon as you feel yourself like mind wandering bring yourself back to that and start again right and the thing is is that what you're trying to do is fill your mind with a specific task so that and focus on it and kind of get your breathing in alignment and then what that's doing is it's trying to interrupt this like constant like in buddhism they call it like the the running the crazy running horses of your mind it helps people to disengage from worries about the past and about future problems that might not occur i like these pictures because it kind of gets to the point right it's like person's taking their dog for the walk and the person's thinking about if you look at that right maybe worrying about a conversation with their wife they're thinking about their kids thinking about the car they're thinking about you know bills coming through the door they're thinking of, there's like a stand there with the mic maybe they got to give a speech there's like all this kind of background music and noise in their head and they're like the dog just sees the trees and feels the warmth of the sun And I think that's like one of the biggest gifts having kids has given me is like, is that, and you might've heard me say stuff like this before, but like going on walks with my older daughter, it's like, I remember when she was like two or three and we'd go on walks when she was like kind of, not first starting to talk, she could definitely talk, but like starting to get really inquisitive and I remember it'd be just a joy walking with her because all of a sudden she'd stop and she'd just be like, do you realize that in this driveway there's only two different colors of stone that, and it's like just something that like, it's actually kind of cool. It's like kind of cool how they designed this like little rock garden or whatever, but I would just like, you know, as our, as grumpy adults, we're just like walking to the street and we're not like walking and appreciating everything and like, but she's like so in the, she was like so in the moment. And dogs are absolutely like that. 
So anyways, I just wanted to tell that quick story. I thought that this was a good picture to show the idea. In the last 10 years, there's been some very interesting developments in evolutionary biology, neurocognitive science, child development research, and many other fields, which is beginning to challenge some of these long-held shibboleths that we've had about human nature and the meaning of the human journey. But there is another frame of reference emerging in the sciences, which is quite interesting. It really challenges these assumptions. And with that, the institutions that we have created based on those assumptions, our educational institutions, our business practices, our governing institutions, etc., let me take you back to the early 1990s, sleepy little laboratory in Parma, Italy, and scientists had a MRI brain scanning machine on a macaque monkey as the macaque monkey was trying to open up a nut. They wanted to see how the neurons would light up. So the monkey's trying to open up the nut, the neurons light up, and just by serendipity, and this is how science sometimes happens, a human being walked into the laboratory, I don't know if it was by mistake, and he was hungry, he saw the nuts and opened up one of the nuts and tried to crack it open. The macaque monkey was totally shocked because who was this invader in his laboratory? And he didn't move. He just gazed at this human trying to open up the nut, just like he had done a few seconds earlier. And then the scientist looked on the MRI brain scanner. The same exact neurons were lighting up when he observed the human being opening the nut as when the monkey opened the nut. And the scientists had not a clue as to what this was. They thought the MRI machine had broken. They then began to put MRI brain scanning machines on other primates, especially chimpanzees with our big, big neocortex. Then they went to humans. And what they found over and over again is something called mirror neurons. And that is that we are apparently softwired, some of the primates, all humans. We suspect elephants. We're not sure about dolphins and dogs. We've just begun. But all humans are softwired with mirror neurons so that if I'm observing you, your anger, your frustration, your sense of rejection, your joy, whatever it is, and I, I can feel what you're doing, the same neurons will light up in me as if I'm having that experience myself. Now, this isn't all that unusual. We know if a spider goes up someone's arm and I'm observing it going up your arm, I'm going to get a creepy feeling. We take this for granted, but we are actually softwired to actually experience another's plight as if we are experiencing ourselves. But mirror neurons are just the beginning of a whole range of research going on in neuropsychology and brain research and in child development that suggests that we are actually softwired not for aggression and violence and self-interest and utilitarianism, that we are actually softwired for sociability, attachment, as John Bowlby might have said, affection, companionship, and that the first drive is the drive to actually belong. It's an empathic drive. What is empathy? It's very complicated. When little babies in a nursery and one baby cries, the other babies will cry in response. They just don't know why. That's empathic distress. It's built into their biology. Around two and a half years of age, a child actually can begin to recognize himself in a mirror. That's when you begin to mature empathy as a cultural phenomenon. And that is once a, a toddler can identify themselves, then they know that if they're observing someone else have a feeling, they know that if they feel something, it's, it's because they're feeling it because someone else has it. They're two separate beings. Selfhood goes together with empathic development. Increasing selfhood, increasing empathic development. Around eight years of age, a child learns about birth and death. They learn where they came from, that they have a one and only life, that life is fragile and vulnerable, and one day they're going to die. That's the beginning of an existential trip. Because when a child learns about birth and death and they have a one and only life, they realize how fragile and vulnerable life is. It's very tough being alive on this planet, whether you're a human being or a fox navigating the forest. So when a child learns that life is vulnerable and fragile and that every moment is precious and that they have their own unique history, it allows the child then to experience another's plight in the same way, that that other person or other being, could be another creature, has a one and only life, it's tough to be alive, and the odds are not always good. So if you think about the times that we've empathized with each other or fellow creatures, it's always because we felt their struggle. We have the width of death and empathy and the celebration of life and we show solidarity with our compassion. Empathy is the opposite of utopia. There is no empathy in heaven. I guarantee you, I'll tell you before you get there. There isn't any empathy in heaven because there's no mortality. There's no empathy in utopia because there is no suffering. 
Empathy is grounded in the acknowledgement of death and the celebration of life and rooting for each other to flourish and be. It's based on our frailties and our imperfections. So when we talk about building an empathic civilization, we're not talking about utopia. We're talking about the ability of human beings to show solidarity, not only with each other, but our fellow creatures who have a one and only life on this little planet. We are homo empathicus. So here's the question. We know that consciousness changes in history. The way our brain is wired today is not the way a medieval serf's brain would be wired, and that their brain wouldn't be the same as the wiring of a forager hunter 30,000 years ago. So the question I asked at the beginning of this study six years ago is, how does consciousness change in history? Because I wanted to imagine the following proposition. Is it possible that we human beings who are soft-wired for empathic distress, is it possible we could actually extend our empathy to the entire human race as an extended family and to our fellow creatures as part of our evolutionary family and to the biosphere as our common community? If it's possible to imagine that, then we may be able to save our species and save our planet. And when I say to you tonight, if it's impossible to even imagine that, I don't see how we're going to make it. Empathy is the invisible hand. Empathy is what allows us to stretch our sensibility with another so that we can cohere in larger social units. To empathize is to civilize. To civilize is to empathize. With forage or hunter societies, communication only extended to the local tribe and shouting distance. Everyone over in the next mountain was the alien other. So empathy only extended to blood ties. When we went to the great hydraulic agricultural civilization, script allowed us to extend the central nervous system and to annihilate more time and space and bring more people together. And the differentiation of skills and the increasing selfhood not only led to theological consciousness, but empathy now extended to a new fiction. And that is, instead of just associating with one's blood ties, we detribalize and began association based on religious ties. So a new fiction, Jews start to see all other Jews as extended family and empathize with Jews. Christians start to see all other Christians as extended family and empathize with Christians. Muslims, the same. When we get to the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution, and we extend markets now to larger areas and create a fiction called the nation state. And all of a sudden, the Brits start to see others in in Britain as extended family. The Germans start to see Germans as extended family, the Americans as Americans. There was no such thing as Germany. There was no such thing as France. These are fictions. But they allow us to extend our family so that we can have loyalties and identities based on the new complex energy communication revolutions we have that annihilate time and space. But if we have gone from empathy in blood ties to empathy in, in religious associational ties, to empathy based on national identification, is it really a big stretch to imagine the new technologies allowing us to connect our empathy to the human race writ large in a single biosphere? And what reason would we stop here at the nation state identity and only have ideological empathy or theological based empathy or tribal based blood tie empathy? We have the technology that allows us to extend the central nervous system and to think viscerally as a family, not just intellectually. When that earthquake hit Haiti and then Chile, but especially Haiti, within an hour the Twitters came out, and within two hours some cell phone videos, YouTube, and within three hours the entire human race was in an empathic embrace coming to the aid of Haiti. If we were, as the Enlightenment philosophers suggested, in materialistic, self-interested, utilitarian, pleasure-seeking, it couldn't account for the response to Haiti. Apparently, 175,000 years ago in the Rift Valley of Africa, there were about 10,000 anatomically modern human beings walking the grasslands, our ancestors. The geneticist located one database woman. It's a data baseline. Apparently, her genes passed to everyone in this room tonight. The other ladies didn't make it. It gets even more strange. They, they located a single male. This is a data baseline for genetics. They call him the Y chromosome Adam. Apparently, a fairly potent guy. His genes passed to everyone in this room. So here's the news. 6.8 billion people at various stages of consciousness, theological, ideological, psychological, dramaturgical, we're all fighting with each other with different ideas about the world. And guess what? We all came from two people. The Bible got this one right. We could have come from many. But the point is we have to begin thinking as an extended family. We have to broaden our sense of identity. We don't lose the old identities of nationhood and our religious identities, and even our blood ties. 
but we extend our identity so we can think of the human race as our fellow sojourners and our other creatures here as part of our evolutionary family and the biosphere as our community. We have to rethink the human narrative. If we are truly homo empathicus, then we need to bring out that core nature because if it doesn't come out and it's repressed by our parenting, our educational system, our business practice and government, the secondary drives come, the narcissism, the materialism, the violence, the aggression. If we can have a global debate, let it start here from the British Royal Society for the Arts, which apparently you're doing, to begin rethinking human nature, to bring out our empathic sociability so that we can rethink the institutions of society and prepare the groundwork for an empathic civilization. Thanks for watching CHSF 2106. Awesome class. You're a great group of people. And uh, catch you next week. Or not? No, I won't. Next week's your reading week. Enjoy your time. Please uh, do whatever you need to do to, you know, reconnect and, I don't know, enjoy your week. All right. Um, I'll be in touch soon. Cheers.